So let me introduce you to uh, the first presenter. His name is Scott Blossom. He's president of Blossom Consulting and, and Engineering. And his uh, presentation is titled Hydro Hydrologic and Hydraulic Modeling, Today's and Tomorrow's Design Scenarios. Scott, take it away. Long rumble come across the meadow, rain pouring in the bucket's full, guy cracking and the whole house shaking. All these storms I know will weather, all these storms will ride together. Greetings, I'm Scott Blossom, Blossom Consulting and Engineering. And thank you for taking the time to tune in to the virtual ASFPM Floodplain Management Conference. We're going to look at hydrologic and hydraulic analysis. Today's and tomorrow's design storms. I'm going to be your tour guide as we explore a variety of case studies. Before we do, let's look closely at this quote from Lou Leopold. The health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. It can also be viewed as the health of the land is the principal measure of how we live on the water. At Blossom Consulting and Engineering, we specialize on this interrelationship between land and water and what happens at this interface in relation to design storms that give us some insight into predictive decision making. The first project is at the University of Richmond. This project is located upstream of where the James River flows through the downtown area. The James in that location is bound by a flood wall. In this location, the Kanawha Canal flows parallel to the James and forms the downstream boundary condition for our project. Our project is shown with the green highlight, and it's a stream restoration project, which is also located downstream of the University Commons Lake. University Commons Lake is controlled by a high hazard dam, which is regulated by the Virginia Safe Dam Safety Program. In addition, on the right side of your screen, you'll see the FEMA floodplain mapping. This project site was bound on the up and downstream ends by a regulated FEMA floodplain. Given that today's presentation is on design storms, let's look at the range of floods that were evaluated as a component of this project. Starting at the bottom, the regression analysis and regional equations were utilized to evaluate the bankful design scenario or that channel forming design flow. If you look in the center of your screen, you'll see the 100 year discharge. This is a discharge associated with the 0.1 chance recurrence interval storm event and was pretty common for a FEMA based analysis along with the 10. 50 and 500 year events. In the upper portion of your screen, you'll see the dam safety flows. This analysis is running parallel to our floodplain analysis, but you'll see that the flows in here represent the probable maximum flood with the discharge that is associated with the probable maximum precipitation. Let's look at that a little closer. Here's an excerpt from the hydrolytic. Hydrologic Engineering Center's HMR 52, which gives us guidance on evaluation of the probable maximum storm. You can see that there is consideration for the relative timing and sub-basins, as well as consideration of the relationship of the storm's spatial distribution over the watershed boundary. On the right portion of your screen, you'll see a typical intensity, duration, and frequency relationship as presented by NOAA's ALICE 14. Of course, this IDF curve allows us to quickly evaluate any combination of intensities, durations, and frequencies in terms of rainfall depths. Here we are zooming in at the freshly constructed stream restoration project. And this is a great view because it allows us to see the inner berm features as well as the bankful design features that are associated with that more recurring storm event, the half inch to the one inch rainfall event, or potentially even lower. Given that, the intention for this more frequently occurring design storm analysis 
is associated with an ecosystem restoration component or a habitat restoration component where we're trying to restore the beneficial functions of the floodplain by encouraging floodplain connectivity on a very frequent basis. However, when you look at the 100-year event, it looks a lot different as it spreads across the floodplain valley on that terrace. And of course, you can see the critical importance of evaluating the pre and post restoration conditions given the development on the downstream boundary. In addition, you might notice the potential for the Kanawha Canal to affect the hydraulics in the culvert that leads up to the restoration reach. Of course, the point here is that we're, we'd like to mention that this type of evaluation casts a wide net to evaluate a variety of different boundary conditions so that we can ensure that that no net rise or no adverse impact is attained under a variety of design scenarios while we're still improving the beneficial functions of the floodplain. This is what it looks like in cross-section view, this rendering provided by Water Street Studio. At the bottom, you can see the restored Little Weston Creek and the inner berm terrace, which is highlighted in yellow. Above there, you see a bankful design feature. If you move to the left of your screen, you'll see a highlighted pedestrian trail. This terrace could be associated with, say, maybe a 10 or 25 year design story. Moving farther left in the blue highlight, there's a potential for some relief floodplain storage. Of course, with negotiations with the adjacent property owner, perhaps this adjacent golf course corridor could be used as a place for floodplain retention during some of these large storm events. This would allow for some safe storage prior to accessing the red highlighted terrace on the right side of your screen, where we might have susceptible infrastructure or structures themselves. On our tour, let's take a shift over to the Shenandoah Valley. And here you see the North Fork and the South Fork of the Shenandoah, which flow north up to the Potomac River. Before we get into these projects, I wanted to mention the target design species, the Eastern Brook Trout. You might ask, what does the Eastern Brook Trout have to do with design storms and scenarios? Well, if we were looking at, say, a dam removal project or a fish habitat enhancement project, we might be considering sediment transport or potentially evaluating the hydraulic characteristics associated with various facets along the stream channel looking at ripples and pools and runs and glides, and thinking about how the hydraulics, which are driven by, in some cases, precipitation events in combination with base flow, are affected by various design storms. And what can we do in our designs to create the conditions that are conducive for those type of metro activities to continue? This is a nice bird's eye view of perhaps one of the most developed meander patterns that I've had the chance to evaluate, the seven bends of the Shenandoah River. I mention this because it's a great time to cover channel evolution. This very established and evolved river system has migrated laterally until it found a structural confine into the valley wall. It's interesting to note also that there are historic and cultural features that have established themselves along even the inner portions of the meander bend situation. The river dynamic is something that can be understood the more that we understand the design storms that contribute to its evolution. Our friends in the Pacific Northwest have shown us some great tools, this one from the Washington State Department of Ecology, where they're using this predictive element of watershed assessment, and understanding of historic meander and channel alignments in consideration of where this channel might move next and how can we use this understanding to better plan where development may occur or areas where development needs to be avoided because of a severe erosion hazard. It's great to know that in the water resource engineering field, we have a variety of tools that allow us to assess floodplain connectivity for a variety of storm events. Again, for those more frequently occurring storm events, we might be looking at floodplain connectivity for nutrient reduction objectives. While at the same time, we need to have a very 
surgical approach to dissecting the river valley so that we can balance landowner and stakeholder interests. And what I mean by this is, while we can attain increases in beneficial functions of floodplains through stream restoration activities, there's also the opportunity to use the hydraulic modeling to set, in this case, potentially elevation of adjacent agricultural fields. Is there a certain storm event in which we can keep those fields dry to improve crop yield? So a nice balance between habitat objectives and landowner objectives and balancing that with stakeholder interests as well, all while considering beneficial functions of floodplain, no rise and no adverse impact. Okay, so on our tour, the next stop is a 100 year old military base in North Carolina. In 2016, this base sustained significant damage and road closures due to Hurricane Matthew. Blossom Consulting and Engineers' charge was to evaluate this 4,000-acre watershed in order to gain a better understanding of how roads overtop and what are the road overtopping conditions as it relates to watershed response. The course requirements in this case, um, they required a deliverable that was an SDS FIE compliant geodatabase along with the hydrologic and hydraulic model. So in this case, PC Swim was used, was used to deliver that product. Here we're looking at a zoomed in view of the convoluted spaghetti network of existing roads and natural structure. I'd like to draw your attention to the little blue dots, which represent about 600 hydraulic, hydraulic cross sections, which were generated using LIDAR topography and supplement it with field survey cross sections. The purpose was to allow us to get a detailed evaluation of road overtopping conditions from various storm events so that we could improve the base's ability to respond and deploy during those emergency situations. Once the model was developed and we had essentially the skeleton of the watershed structure built, the design storms that the Corps requested were quite interesting. We looked at the, the standard 10, 50, 200 year, 24 hour synthetic rainfall distribution events, but also looked at what would happen when we stacked a second one of those events of equal duration and magnitude on top of it, perhaps seven days later. And for that matter, the Corps also requested a 40-year precipitation data set to be loaded into the model at a 15-second interval, which would allow us to bracket different design periods and design scenarios and evaluate watershed response and the hydraulic performance of that whole watershed and storm drain and natural stream network. This is a, a very robust tool that also allows for diving in to separate sub-basins to potentially develop the one-dimensional model into a two-dimensional model, which allows for consideration of timing of sub-basin response with runoff consideration and storage areas and off-channel depressions that could be used to store floodwaters and how does that all come together in terms of mitigating road overtopping. One potential next step that is currently being looked at is the installation of gauges and monitoring stations and sensors to allow for real-time feedback and potentially even a forecasting type analysis to occur to where we can use this tool to get out in front of some of these storm events of course, develop creative solutions within the watershed beforehand, but also have a good understanding about what roads might overtop first and how we can change the circulation patterns in order to respond to those extreme storm events. Okay, so back to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. 
This is a 64,000 square mile watershed. And you can see the Potomac River shed just kind of nested within it. Our project area in this case is that fish hook shaped meander bend of the Potomac River. And as we take the magnifying glass and zoom in to that project area, we can see that we're looking at a high energy shoreline that is essentially affected by the six mile fetch across the Potomac River. What's also interesting about this project is even though this is a highly dynamic area with massive amounts of sediment deposition and transport associated with these extreme storm events, there was a Native American shell midden that influenced the design as well. This led us to a fill-based approach to protect the susceptible military infrastructure while still allowing for protection of the Native American shell mid. In this case, Hurricane Fran was selected as the design storm, and we were able to raise the elevation of, in this case, the structural revetment to levels beyond what we saw in Hurricane Fran but also taper the revetment into more of a hybrid living shoreline, which involved evaluation of tidal fluctuations as they relate to different vegetated zones. Okay, so let's continue our tour and look at a much more extreme event. This is Hurricane Irma. Irma was a Category 5 major hurricane when it passed over the USVI and BVI. Here we're looking at a pre and post aerial image of the phenomenon known as island browning. Island browning is essentially when the canopy cover is removed, and in many cases, the root mass that binds the island together is also dislodged. The problem that was faced in this scenario was that right behind Hurricane Irma was Hurricane Maria a second Category 5, which passed over nearly the same area, dropping over 40 inches of rain in about a three-day period. Here is a video taken during Hurricane Maria. For reference, in the upper left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the still water elevation from a photo I took about a year after the hurricane. The video, however, is being shot from a deck which has a elevation of 52. Again, that wave crashed at an elevation of 52. In addition to the considerations of coastal high hazard areas, there is also a consideration for guts, or the ephemeral stream channels that drain the hillsides during massive precipitation events. As you can see from this graphic, these ephemeral stream channels are in steep topographic regions, and when it rains, these ephemeral channels pump, run off. And from the location of these guts, you can see that there is obviously considerations to be addressed in relation to the development patterns. I'd say roughly 90% of the projects that we've seen over the past 15 or 20 years have involved situations where you have a large contributing watershed and a coastal high hazard area which interface and interreact at the location where development is situated. This photo, taken about a year after Irma and Maria, is quite encouraging because it also shows the phenomenon of island greening. You can see that with resilient vegetation comes a resilient population. And while catastrophic, this event also op offered an opportunity to look at infrastructure improvements and consider techniques such as elevation, terracing, and balance of earthwork activities to allow for as much storage as we could possibly get to store some of the runoff coming from those ephemeral guts during extreme events, but also begin to plan for where that flow might exit as it tries to find its way towards the coastal sea. In this case, 
we got cut about a 30 to 35 foot wide swath into the shoreline. Here you can also see the observed water surface elevation as it was communicated to us from the riders of the storm, the islanders who were there present during the hurricane. A standard typical Atlas 14 synthetic type 3 rainfall distribution could be used to simulate this type of event. But obviously there is a multifaceted approach that needs to be instilled in order for recovery to happen efficiently. In this case, that began with an evaluation of rainwater harvesting, which in terms of a design scenario is quite different. In that case, we're looking at a water budget, which is a balance of supply and demand. After establishing the basic needs, this multifaceted approach also includes installation of raised roadways, stabilized beachside channels with grade control, and a hidden stabilized emergency spillway designed to safely convey the flows from the upland hillsides, but also allow for the preservation and reconstruction of the sand dune. It's interesting to note that there's also a target design species in mind here as well. This is the threatened Acropora palmata, the elkhorn coral, and it is a very fragile component of a much larger ecosystem, which forms our first line of defense against coastal storms. It's very critical that as a component of our rebuilding efforts, we also consider the regeneration of species that are affected and consider them in our restoration plan. Back to Virginia, I'd like to finish up by mentioning one more project, a tidal and non-tidal wetland and floodplain restoration project. The area shown here in beige is actually an oyster reef creation area. Again, stabilizing and rebuilding that first line of defense, which then gives way to a more vegetated buffer, in this case, some preserved tidal wetlands. You might ask, well, what type of design storms and scenarios would you evaluate in this scenario? Well, luckily we have a nearby tide gate, which allows us to get an understanding of the tidal fluctuations and how those might influence the vegetative zone for fluid plan and design in consideration of potential sea level rise. In addition, for dam removal, we would be looking at tidal inlet hydraulics as well as precipitation-driven runoff at that interface. What's exciting in this world of natural design is that we do have a blueprint. There are areas that exist, in many cases, near or adjacent to projects that we all might be working on, that are great blueprints or reference reaches or reference examples of how we might design natural systems in order to withstand a range of design flows. So using the reference reach as a blueprint to replicate natural systems and incorporate species considerations as we select our range of design storms. With that, I'd like to thank, thank you for taking the time to explore how design storms are influenced by species and how coastal high hazard areas also have considerations for upland runoff that need to be considered at that interface of riverine and tidal or coastal interaction. And we also took a quick tour through a highly evolved channel and got an understanding of channel evolution and how that might be used to better our planning initiatives and identify high hazard areas in the future. Again, I'd like to thank you for your commitment to floodplain management, encourage you to stay positive, and to always remember all these storms we will ride together. Thank you very much from Blossom Consulting and Engineering, and I'll hang around for a few minutes for questions. Take care. Thank you, Scott, for your presentation. We appreciate uh, the work you've done putting this together. 
I will encourage the attendees in this session to please uh, present your uh, questions and comments in the uh, sidebar on the in the comment section of your window on the right hand side. We'll give you a few minutes to continue uh, thinking about and adding any questions that you may have. Uh, I do want to apologize if uh, at the beginning of the session uh, you were not able to hear a portion of what how I was introducing, but um, we um, uh, appreciate everyone being here today. And uh, as we wait for more questions to come in, I guess I, I have a, a couple questions I can ask uh, Scott here. Scott, um, the presentation shows a lot of um, projects in a lot of variety of places. And I'm curious, um, as, as you've been involved with these projects, uh, the, the local regulations and the local data availability, I imagine, is a big factor in how you do the studies and in the kind of models that you end up using and, and so forth. Would you like to uh, maybe speak a little bit about how local regulations or uh, available information might influence some of these studies that you've shown us? Definitely, definitely. Thank you for the question. Can you hear me okay? I hear you. Great. Uh, well, certainly it does vary geographically um, in terms of what data is available. Uh, one of the last projects we showed um, actually has a nearby gauge and we were looking at tidal fluctuations. So of course, having that was a, a benefit that would result in some direct uh, you know, savings in terms of the client's goals. Uh, in one of the first projects we looked at, um, we had a variety of uh, types of information available to us, um, which is great, but uh, due to the range, you can see the need to really filter through that information and find out what would be most relevant to you know, the specific project intentions that we were looking at in that case. Um, so we do find you know, that in um, you would start out you know, by identifying the, some of the federal regulations that might apply, but then all the way down to the local regulations, uh, certainly would have to address on everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the, the varying nature of it is certainly the exciting part of being in this field, as I'm sure that, that you know, each one has its um, kind of unique components. Yes. And we, we do have a few more questions that have been popped up here. Uh, it says, uh, great presentation, Scott. Do you ever struggle to identify the delineation between coastal flood risk and riverine flood risk and when, when you are attempting to model watersheds similar to the ones you've shown? Uh, another great question, and I'd say uh, a continued area of development in our analysis and what we understand in terms of the industry as well. Uh, myself, you know, I'm in the Hampton Roads region. Uh, we certainly have coastal and tidal considerations. Uh, as you get farther up on the peninsula, we have more riverine to really address. And then so where those interface, certainly um, we're needing to be creative and make sure that we cast a wide enough net to capture uh, the different potentials uh, involved. So certainly I, I would say that, yes, it's a challenging endeavor as I'm sure many folks have come across, uh, but, but we find that uh, as more data becomes available in terms of years of record, that is certainly helping as well. Well, thank you, Scott. We've uh, reached the time limit for this session, uh, and I want to encourage anybody to, uh, if you had a question that we were not able to get to, um, you can reach out directly uh, to Scott. And uh, of course, these videos will be available online uh, after the session uh, at some point. So we are ready to begin our next next session. I do want to uh, give a, a special thank you to our uh, our sponsor, uh, Jacobs. And I tried to mention the our thanks to them in the beginning. I'm not sure if that came through or not, but uh, I'll do that again. And as we are getting ready for the second presentation today in session D2. Uh, again, I want to introduce, I want to say hello to you. Good morning. I'm, I'm Glenn Heaston with the Illinois State Water Survey. And uh, in case anybody was not able to hear that at the beginning. So session number two uh, is going to be presented by uh, Andrew Park Friend. 
He's a water resources engineer with Michael Baker International, and his uh, presentation is titled Climate Change in Your Hometown, an overview of how what, you see, what we see in the media can be distilled into a practical application of future flood risk for your community. So Andrew, if you are ready, we'll go ahead and get you started. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Park Friend. I'm with Michael Baker International in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and this presentation is called Climate Change in Your Hometown. I'm hoping to uh, show uh, how we can analyze uh, riverine flooding and how it will be impacted by climate change uh, at the local level. So these are some uh, <coughs> headlines on climate change that I um, <coughs> that I picked out a couple months ago. Um, so we got climate change affected Australia's wildfires. Climate change is threatening winter sports. Uh, climate change might adversely impact the uh, maple syrup industry. Uh, you know, all sorts of all sorts of stories, and. At least in my experience, they're they're all over the board. Obviously, climate change will have a lot of different impacts on our life in a lot of different ways. Um, but it's not necessarily easy to uh, find information on climate change and how it will affect riverine flooding, especially a river, uh, a local river that you might care about. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to get into here today. <coughs> Here's a couple of the best uh, resources uh, that you can look at, and I recommend starting here. Um, on the left, we have the Climate Science Special Report. Uh, this is from the fourth National Climate Assessment. Uh, so this, this document, um, which also is online and has a lot of great interactive uh, visuals, uh, covers the entire United States. Uh, so it'll have a lot of different climate information on. You know, West Coast, East Coast, riverine, ocean, a drought, flood, everything. Um, and then the second <clears throat> other major resource that I'd recommend is uh, most states also have their own climate assessment. Uh, so the example I have here is uh, for the state of Montana. They did their own climate assessment in 2017 um, where they analyzed how climate would impact their state in particular. So gets gets a little bit more granular, talks about how it will impact their state, maybe even different regions within the state. Um, so like I said, that's the Montana example. Uh, there are other, but mo most states have their own examples as well. Uh, here's a <coughs> graph from the National Climate Assessment. This is two-day precipitation events exceeding a five-year recurrence interval. And you'll note from uh, the years on the x-axis here that this is based on actual data from the past. So this is, this is not projecting anything forward. This is what is happening right now and what has been happening the past few years. And uh, you can see uh, there's a pretty significant uptick in these more extreme precipitation events, um, you know, really starting in the 80s and 90s maybe, and uh, it's been pretty significantly growing since then. And so one conclusion of the National Climate Assessment is that these extreme precipitation events uh, are already happening. This is not just some future projection, this is already happening. Okay, now we're looking at a map, and this is future projections. So you see on the left side of the map, or the left side of the, the figure here, we have maps for mid-century, so 2050 or so. And on the right side of the figure, we have maps for late century, so closer to the year 2100. And this is the projected change in daily 20-year extreme precipitation, again, according to the uh, National Climate Assessment. And so you can see there are some regional differences. Um, you know, uh, looking at the figure, the map on the upper left-hand corner, uh, the mid-century under lower, lower emissions, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, 8% uh, or 9% there, 8% uh, 
uh, Montana, the Dakotas, uh, 10% uh, in the Northeast, for example. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> that is projected to increase uh, uh, going to later in the century to, century to 10, 13, 14 uh, percent projected change in 20 year extreme precipitation. Um, also important to note, you've got two different emission scenarios here, right? We've got the uh, lower emission scenario where uh, humans uh, figure out a way to lower their overall emissions and a higher emission scenario. And obviously with a higher emission scenario, as you would expect, the impact is higher. <clears throat> so here's two key findings from the National Climate Assessment. Uh, number one, uh, the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events are projected to continue to increase over the 21st century. Um, and they say this with high confidence. One of the interesting things about the National Climate Assessment is that they'll tell you about the, the uncertainty they have in these calculations. So some, some of these things have low confidence, some of these things have high confidence, and uh, they are highly confident that the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events will continue to increase. Uh, second key finding, uh, there are important regional and seasonal differences in projected changes uh, in total precipitation. So northern United States is projected to receive more precipitation in the winter and spring, and parts of the southwestern United States are projected to receive less precipitation in the winter and spring. Here's another uh, interesting image from the National Climate Assessment. Uh, this is a snowpack or snow water equivalent uh, in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, you can see, it, um, you know, white, white is the higher amount of snow water equivalent uh, in the mountains. And so you can see right now, pretty widespread and shrinking, shrinking, shrinking by the end of the century. So we'll have uh, less snowpack in the mountains. Uh, in the future going forward. Again, this is from the National Climate Assessment. <clears throat> so here's the key finding regarding snowpack. Uh, substantial reductions in western U.S. winter and spring snowpack are projected as the climate warms. Earlier spring melt and reduced snow water equivalent have been formally attributed to human-induced warming, high confidence, and will very likely be exacerbated as the climate continues to warm. So uh, the evidence is uh, from the National Climate Assessment, extreme precipitation events generally going up, snowpack generally going down in the future. What about at the state level? Again, uh, this example is from the Montana Climate Assessment, but most states have their own climate assessment, so you can look up uh, your state of interest. Uh, in the Montana Climate Assessment, they found the effects of climate change on flooding will be location and event specific. And specifically, this, this matches with the National Climate Assessment. Rain-driven events, flooding is going to get worse in the future. Uh, Snowmelt-driven events, uh, there's you know, obviously less snowpack, so those snowmelt-driven events will probably be less extreme in the future. And then finally, <clears throat> rain on snow. Well, that's a lot trickier. Um, but there's some evidence that at higher elevations, uh, uh, we'll have uh, we'll have high, we'll have larger flood events, and at lower elevations, the flooding events will decrease, which makes some sense because uh, we know that the snowpack is uh, will stick around at, for longer. Uh, at the higher elevations, even during a climate change scenario in the future. Uh, <clears throat> this figure is from a study in 2013, so it's a little bit um, it's a little bit dated, but uh, I think it, it gives a good visual of how um, <clears throat> how geographically different climate change is expected to impact riverine flooding and. Just looking at the United States, uh, so blue areas here are where we're expecting riverine flooding to get worse. 
and red areas here are where we're expecting flooding to be not as significant in the future as it is now. So you can see uh, <coughs> pretty, pretty much blue in the southeastern United States, so flooding expected to get worse. And then uh, a lot of red in the southwest, Texas, uh, New Mexico, so flooding expected to be not as significant in the future according to this 2013 study. Again, this just illustrates the uh, geographic variability um, in the potential uh, change in flood risk uh, in the future. Okay, so probably by this point you might be getting frustrated with this presentation and wondering, well, um, how, how, how am I supposed to figure out how flooding is going to change on the stream in my hometown? Uh, well, the good news is I do have a recommendation there, and that is that you can use uh, the NCHRP Transportation Research Board uh, design procedures. And I'll show you a case study on how we did that uh, in a, for a river in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, the first thing to understand is that these <coughs> design procedures are based on general circulation models, sometimes called GCMs. Um, uh, these are climate models that uh, models everything having to do with climate and how climate circulates around the globe and all the physical processes uh, that we know of in the atmosphere and how it interacts with your surface. These are the best available tools to understand the climactic response to greenhouse gas concentration. <clears throat> and the other uh, key thing to know is uh, a more recent breakthrough in technology is LOCA downscaling. So uh, most of the GCM, the general circulation model, have pretty thick grid cells, right? That they're, they're modeling what's going to happen to the entire planet. Um, but you can downscale these uh, using the local loca downscaling method to get a lot more precise uh, modeled information on, and so you can really zoom in on the stream of your choice. So here's the case study. Uh, the use of the NCHRP design procedures on Salt Creek in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, a couple things about this uh, stream. We know it's, uh, it's generally has rain-driven flooding events. Uh, it is both high, a rural and urban watershed uh, with a history of significant floods. And <clears throat> critically, uh, there's a non-accredited levy uh, along Salt Creek, which is designed for a 50-year event. So um, obviously, it's really important to understand <clears throat> how this flooding source might change in the future, especially with that levy. So uh, now we'll get into the to the technical part of how how the, the steps in the NCHRP process. Um, step one: uh, determine historical observed 24-hour precipitation quantiles. Okay, so this is a pretty easy step. Uh, we just looked up the precipitation depths from the NOAA atlas, and there there they are. On the right. Step two: uh, select baseline and future periods. So um, we know that the NOAA Atlas is based on historical data, and so that's kind of, that's, that's our baseline. And, but we want to project forward to a future period, and in this case, uh, the city of Lincoln was interested in the second half of this century. So uh, we have a baseline uh, where we have existing data from 1950 to through 2005, and we're interested in uh, what the flooding will look like in our future period, which we selected to be 2051 through 2059. Step three uh, is to identify the future emissions scenarios. So uh, each of these models uses uh, one of these generally accepted emission scenarios. Uh, they're, they're called RCPs, Representative Concentration Pathways, uh, and then a number at the end. Um, Basically saying these are, these are est estimates or assumptions on how much greenhouse gas will be present in the atmosphere in the future. So RCP 8.5 is sometimes referred to as the business as usual scenario, uh, where uh, we as a society continue uh, 
to increase the rate at which we um, put greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and then there's our RCP 4.5 is the other one we looked at, and this is a greenhouse gas emissions scenario where the emissions will continue to rise in 2040, uh, at which point they will stabilize and moderately decline. So this is a little bit more optimistic scenario uh, where, um, where we stop putting quite so much greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Step four, uh, identify the GCMs of interest. Um, <clears throat> there's, I don't know, a couple dozen uh, different uh, general circulation models that are uh, publicly available. These are uh, created by usually academic teams or um, you know, national institutions. And so we selected seven different GCMs uh, to analyze here. Um, as you can see, they all have pretty awesome names. Step five, identify all the downscaled grid cells for the base and download the local data. So uh, in red here, this is the Salt Creek watershed and the white, the whitish gray is, are the grid cells uh, from the models that we wanted to download. Okay, so we've downloaded all our data, all our global climate or general circulation model data. Uh, next step is to extract annual maximum series for each grid cell, uh, GCM, and future scenarios. So uh, this model data comes with uh, daily precipitation totals. So you go through and for uh, each year you select uh, the annual maximum. Uh, next step uh, is to compute 24-hour quantiles for each for each period in grid cell. Um, using a, a log Pearson relationship. And then step eight, compute uh, baseline and future quantile ratios for all grids, GCMs, and future scenarios. So in this case, remember we had a baseline, um, which was 1950 through 2005. Uh, so we determined uh, that the 1% annual chance precipitation depth for the baseline was 87 millimeters. And then we have a uh, future time period, which uh, for this case study was 2050 through 2099. And we determined that the 1% annual chance precipitation was 99.9 uh, .9 millimeters. Uh, remember, remember, this is a, a daily precipitation. And then you calculate the ratio of the future to the baseline. So in this case, 1.16. Uh, step nine, uh, estimate projected 24 hour precipitation quantiles uh, by multiplying the future to baseline ratio by the existing precipitation. So uh, the line in this table, existing precipitation, that's the data we got in step one from the NOAA Atlas. Uh, we have the ratio, that's, the, that's what we got in step eight on the ratio of the baseline time period to the future time period. And so you multiply those together and you get a future 24 hour precipitation. Step 10, uh, use future precipitation values to perform analysis. Uh, so uh, in our case for Salt Creek, uh, there was an HMS model. Uh, so we put the revised precipitation values into the HMS model, uh, got revised discharges out of that, and plugged those into the RAS model. And here you can see our final results. So again, I'll, I'll zero in on the 1% annual chance event. Uh, we had an average increase in discharge of 6,500 CFS, which is about 28%. This, remember, this is future conditions compared to effective conditions. And then when we plug that 28% increase in discharge into the HECRAS hydraulic model, uh, that leaves us with an average increase of water surface elevation for the 1% event of 2.2 feet. So, uh, this, this brings home how important it is to always consider the future risk. 2.2 uh, feet uh, might not sound a lot to a layperson, but I think 
uh, most of us are pretty familiar with how significant that could be, uh, especially uh, in a populated area with structures, um, or especially uh, in an area that has a levee. Uh, you know, 2.2 feet can definitely make or break that levee. I uh, just wanted to highlight a couple other, um, couple other studies that use this same uh, design procedure uh, that we used in the city of Lincoln. Uh, so this, this has been used elsewhere as well. On the left, we've got the Virginia Transportation Research Council. Um, and they looked at two future time periods, uh, the year 2045 and the year 2085, and looked at how, uh, how the size of the watershed drainage area uh, would impact the future flooding for both of those future time periods. And then uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation also commissioned a study that was uh, done by Baker. And you can see here we have um, uh, different RCPs and different uh, future time periods. And this, this graph is showing the ratio, ratio of future to historic uh, precipitation. And again, those, are, those look like they're all in the range of about 1 to 1.2 for this particular county. A uh, few other notes uh, to keep in mind uh, when you're attempting this design procedure. Uh, the human response to climate change is uncertain uh, and will have a very significant impact on future risk. So if you recall, um, we looked at two different RCPs, uh, which is future emission scenarios, RCP 8.5, which is business as usual, and RCP 4.5, which is more optimistic that we'll be able to curb emissions rates. Um, and, and the difference between those two was significant. Uh, we found that the RCP 4.5 scenario had very little impact on uh, future rainfall, future extreme rainfall events in Lincoln, uh, whereas uh, for RCP 8.5, uh, those were the results we showed you with the 2.2 foot increase uh, in, flood ha in flood hazard along Salt Creek. Um, also, don't forget, uh, changes to future land use uh, may also significantly impact future risk and should be evaluated. So in this case, we did look at that. Uh, City of Lincoln has uh, future growth plans where they anticipate development happening. And uh, we, we made sure to make that change in the HMS model as well to uh, analyze uh, how the land use change might impact the future flood risk. And always account for uncertainty. You know, these models, uh, that's why we use seven different models. Some of the models show, um, different results than others. Some showed a uh, big change in, in flood hazards, some showed just a little change. Um, and obviously uh, the RCP used uh, is another big source of uncertainty in modeling these. And so uh, always need to account for uncertainty and find a way to communicate. All right, uh, thanks for your time. I wanna uh, give a thanks and a shout out to both uh, the city of Lincoln and our partners at Olson Engineering who helped with this study. Uh, at this time, I'll turn it over for questions and comments. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, excellent presentation. I appreciate your insight on the climate change issues. Uh, so now we have a chance with the question and answer to uh, for you to weigh in, the audience to weigh in and chat with our presenter. Uh, I will mention that these presentations will be made available in the future, uh, that if you've missed any of them or you want to go back, they will be available in the future. We don't know when that'll be exactly, but that is the intention. So uh, right now, though, let's, uh, let's jump to the questions in the uh, comment side of our screen. Uh, Andrew, this says uh, from Landon, the 2013 study showed a reduction in the 100-year events in the region and around Texas, but the National Climate Assessment showed an increase. Is this correct? And if so, what is generally considered the most accurate source for climate change project projections? Uh, <clears throat> great question, thanks. I, so um, if you're just choosing between the National Climate Assessment and that 2013 study, I would choose the National Climate Assessment because it is more recent. 
came out within the last year or two. But uh, more to the point, and I think you probably asked this question before the rest of the video played, uh, the, the best way to do it is to uh, go local and use this NCHRP uh, design proposed uh, procedure uh, to figure out what's happening on a local level. Okay. The next question is, uh, is NCHRP 1561 being required? And how is it being used? Uh, how is it being triggered on projects? Is it based on the client's choice? Is it tied to the federal mandate through FHWA or another? Uh, in the case of the case, in, in the case of the case study I just showed there, the city of Lincoln, this was the client's choice. Uh, they were interested in knowing um, what was going to happen to their flood risk in the future, and so this this was our best way to analyze that. I'm uh, not aware of if it's being required uh, on a broader level than that. I'd be interested to know <clears throat> uh, if there's anybody uh, uh, on this call who, who knows an answer to that. I'd, I'd love to see a reply uh, if it's been required on a, on a broader level. I'm only familiar with these few case studies. Okay, next question from Timothy Adams. Uh, how do you select the GCMs of interest? Is there meaningful variation in GCM output across all the models out there? Yes, uh, the GCM. Uh, there was a lot. There's a lot of variation in the GCM. Uh, so we chose, and and that's part of the reason we chose six different GCMs so we could uh, take a wide spectrum, um, kind of look at the average and the extreme, so we could understand what the uncertainty is uh, between the different models. Um, when you're picking the GCMs, it's important to pick ones that are independent of each other. Some of them are kind of, you know, built off another climate model. Uh, so if you're if you're doing multiple GCMs, you don't want to uh, have ones that are all dependent on each other. So we picked six independent GCMs, got a got a pretty wide variety of results. Uh, what you saw there in in some of the last tables were the the average results of between those six GCMs. Okay. Bob Freitag asks, are these forecasts understated? Are the are regime change considerations being considered? Um, it, so I, I, I am not uh, familiar with the uh, specific workings of each and every GCM model. I, I think probably some of them do and some of them don't. So really, again, that emphasizes the importance of of uh, selecting a wide variety of models that uh, maybe pick up on a, a wide variety of uh, different future outcomes. Okay. Uh, another question here from Steve. Does your model take into account future development and impervious areas within the watershed? Yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's also critical. Uh, it, you know, depending on where you are, if there's a lot of future development projected, we used uh, the city of Lincoln has uh, growth plans, uh, so they know where where to expect uh, growth in the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Uh, so we use that to to, in addition to the climate change element, we also use that those growth plans to change the impervious areas. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, we're at the uh, the end of our time, I think, for this session. And I thank uh, everybody for your questions. And I thank Andrew for your presentation. Uh, it's been informative. Uh, of course, if you have other questions, I'm sure Andrew would not mind uh, connecting with you somehow off, offline or, or outside of this session. Uh, and uh, from here, we, we do need to move along to our third presenter of this uh, Session D2, and our third presenter is Patty, uh, and he is a senior water resources engineer with Jacobs. Swami's presentation is titled System Wide Flood Risk Analysis Using Integrated Coastal and Inland Modeling and Tools Development to Analyze Large Asset Database, JEA, System Wide Resiliency Program. Swami, when you're ready, please. Proceed. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Swami Patti. I'm a senior water resource engineer at Jacobs. I'm based at um, Tampa, Florida. Um, I hope everyone is doing doing great, staying safe and healthy wherever you are during these uh, crazy times. Today, I'm very excited to be here and talk about uh, one of my recent projects, the system wide resilience program. 
and now focusing on system wide flood risk analysis using integrated coastal and inline modeling and tools development to analyze large fact database. We'll be, I'll be presenting on behalf of my co authors, Pei Chong Li, who is a coast, senior coastal modeler, and who is a software developer. Lawrence Van der Tech is the PM for this project, and uh, Jason Bird is the deputy PM. And Oliver, Oliver Domingo is uh, the project manager for this project from JEA. Today I will be covering, uh, first I'll briefly introduce JEA and uh, talk about the overall program activities, and then I'll get into climate scenarios and how we use uh, uh, flood modeling uh, to model these various climate scenarios. And I'll talk about risk assessment and the tools we developed. And then I'll briefly touch on uh, flood mit mitigation strategies and benefit cost analysis. JEA is a um, utility authority in the of Jacksonville in Florida, um, in Northeast Florida. It uh, serves the four county region around uh, Jacksonville. Uh, it has about 1,700 facilities that includes water systems, red water systems, what um, became water systems, now the chilled water systems. Uh, it serves about 500,000 customers. As you can see on the on the map here, um, the water, the system service area uh, around the um, around the Jacksonville area. Um, as you can see, it's a very coastal community, um, and it also has a big river system runs through it, which is in Jacksonville. So in terms of uh, understanding the flood risk, it has three different components, coastal, riverine, and also rainfall induced um, in the inland. So with three different mechanisms um, inducing the flooding and all the with all the recent hurricane activities happening in this part of the country, uh, JEA has asked takeups to <coughs> come up with a Good resiliency program uh, that they can implement and make their system more resilient. In that uh, program, uh, these are the activities we covered initially to understand what the ex future extreme weather events look like and uh, use flood models to understand the risk. And then using the flood modeling um, results to conduct vulnerability assessment and risk analysis. And after understanding the perspectives of high risk, we developed the mitigation strategy, and then developed the cost and cost benefit analysis, and then prioritized strategies, and then use this data to update the design and construction standards, and develop resilience plan documents. The first part we did was we looked at climate variables that are impacting the system, right? Sea level rise specification of the two main ones. And we looked at the current sea level rise and the projected sea level rise for that area and used NOAA 2017 sea um, level rise projection, like you can see on the top right graph there. Um, though the projections vary quite a bit between the low end and the high end, extreme high end, we, look, we looked at the intermediate uh, which takes about four feet of sea level rise by 2100. For rainfall, we analyzed the historic rainfall and looked at the uh, Atlas 14 and came up, and also using global climate models, came up with uh, future rainfall projections. We projected based on two different greenhouse scenarios, including RCP 8.8 and RCP 6.0. Um, and we projected for 2040, 2070, and 2100 future conditions. In terms of flood modeling, uh, the methodology we used, the overall methodology, I'll go into details in next slide, the overall methodology is set up the base model and then calibrate it using the historic, uh, historic known hurricane events and uh, compare it with the FEMA 
hundred, five hundred um, published elevation flood maps, and then use the calibrated model to run the climate scenarios for future, and then use those uh, to look at the current and future hundred, five hundred flood plains and depth of flooding at various JEA facilities. For for model calibrations, uh, we use the rainfall analysis, sea level rise analysis, coastal surge analysis. We talk about we'll talk about coastal surge and the inland flooding analysis in the next slide. But these are all these pre-processed analyses we used to come uh, to complete the model and run the simulation. So to get into flood modeling, uh, we needed a good tool that can do both surge and inland flood modeling. We used my 21 flex tool mesh modeling. In terms of inputs, we needed DEM for the inland side and bathymetry for the coastal side. Uh, and then we needed to understand the contributing drainage area uh, for the system. And then, um, and then we need to understand boundary conditions for both the coastal side and from the upstream side where we have a big contributing area for the St. John's River, which we captured in the available USGS gauge data so that can, we can put the water level boundary conditions at the upstream end. So overall flood modeling flowchart, right? Uh, we look at uh, data collection, start with data collection, um, look at all the topographic data, water level data, river flows, precipitation, all those things. And then we look at the existing studies of GMA and maps. And then we take all this data, start developing the search and run models using my 21. And then calibrate, calibrate the model, calibrate and validate the model. And then um, set up the design storm events, including 25 years, 100 years, 100 years, 10 years. And then use that base model to do the future condition models of these three design storm events. So, so flood modeling included surge modeling and inland modeling. So for surge modeling, we started with the hurricane model domain, which is a much larger area to understand various aspects that impact the hurricane track, and then take that to a localized level, which uh, is much close to the area that we are looking at. So surge modeling was conducted for two hurricane tracks, Hurricane Irma and Matthew. Uh, and Hurricane Irma and Matthew. Once we have the surge models completed, we went into inland flood model, which needed both hydrologic and hydraulic inputs. Hydrologic inputs were taken from NCPC linkage data for both Irma and Matthew storming, which were used for calibration and verification. And the design storm event IDF curves were developed by our team. For hydraulic inputs, we took the DEM and defined the mesh within the model domain. Because it's a flexible mesh, we were able to go finer scale for the critical area close to the river coast. And we were able to go coarser um, to keep the model in a reasonable shape. Um, and sometimes models could very uh, computationally intensive, so we, will, we have to do the flexible mesh. Because the area is about more than 2,000 square miles that we have modeled. Um, along with the DEM turbo, we also looked at land use characteristics so that we can define the roughness functions on the ground to define the flow characteristics. And then we, take, when we use the boundary conditions like I talked about uh, by looking at the USGS case test gauge data um, to see the flows coming from upstream from St. John's River and its tribute. And from the coastal side, uh, we did this storm surge boundary. As I said, we are running very large area and we are testing extreme weather events. So we haven't taken, we have not taken subsurface infrastructure into consideration. After the base models were set up, it was calibrated using the hurricane matching. 
and then validate it using Hurricane Irma. And both in both of these, we use the USGS gauges along the river, uh, five gauges. And you can see from the plots, got a very reasonable calibration for Hurricane Matthew. And when we validate it with Hurricane Irma, we still have that reasonableness in the model. Along with the run, uh, setting up the flood models and coming up with the base model setup, parallelly scenario planning was being developed as well. So that yeah, the scenarios were uh, developed to understand the risk for both near-term and long-term conditions for both low gas greenhouse emissions to high gas greenhouse emissions. As you can see, scenarios one, two, R for 2040 for low and high gas emissions, V4 are for 2070 for low and high gas emissions. Five and six focus on 25 year storm events with the low and high gas emissions. And scenario seven is with, with the high end bracket uh, with high rainfall and high sea level rise conditions. As you can see, the rainfall increases from 13.21 in 2040, all the way to 21 inches for a 24-hour storm, 24 storm. Significantly, same with sea level rise in the mean high high. Mean high high currently is at 1.96 feet NMED. By the time you get to 2070, you are at 6.45. There is a significant increase. We'll just put that in a list of uh, scenarios. Uh, it's a different way of looking at it, but basically the scenarios cover both near term and long term uh, with low risk and high risk storm events. Once we have the base model ran for all these eight scenarios, we, were, we started comparing them so that we understand how these increased climate conditions are impacting the AEA facility. As you can see, uh, if you look at the extent, there is, there is the, especially this area where the river is curving, they have a significant increase in flood extent. And in terms of pure numbers, uh, the 100 year storm. Current, that's 206 cities impacted, but if you go to 2040 under the year, uh, the numbering is 288. If you want to further look into it, by the time you get to 2070 conditions, the number of facilities impacted are almost doubled. So there is the need, and uh, J. Eric McMahon did. And then, so that's why we are doing this resilience plan. And from here, we went into actually identifying the monetized risk for all the critical facilities and all the critical assets. So going through the risk assessment process and the alternatives approach started with assets that are of high level of service, meaning if those assets are flooded, the whole system goes down. We started there. And then within those assets, we identified that all the assets that are at risk based on the flood elevation by comparing the flood elevation with the finished flow elevation of the asset. And based on which flood events each asset is flooding, we were able to assign the probability curve and then do the weighted damage cost um, to understand the monetized risk for this facility. So to do the risk assessment, right, we did uh, we come up with the process. What's the risk assessment? It's the probability of hazard occurrence times the potential consequence. Consequences could be direct damages to JEA facilities or indirect damages to JEA customers. I'll be focusing more on direct damages when we develop these tools. 
but the overall ref will help you understand if you want to do something to improve the system is it justified <coughs> to prevent shortfalls and then to prioritize system elements identified as most critical the risk is calculated on an annual basis based on the probability of occurrence of the probability of flood event for a particular asset in a particular year times asset risk cost so this probability associated to each design storm event is a year probability right for a 100 year storm event it's one percent probability a year if for a 25 year storm event it's four percent probability so for each asset we determine If asset is for what is the probability of the asset being flooded? Then we we'll multiply with the asset replacement cost to get the monetized risk. You can look at it in a different way. If you know the if you know a resilience strategy that you want to adapt to a particular asset, you can also look at this calculation as avoided. So. to do that right you need to understand the probability of a flood event for a particular with a particular asset so based on the scenarios we ran using flood model we were able to develop flood probability curves using probability for various design storm events in the known flood elevation for a particular facility based on that the probability curves were Developed, looking at not just current conditions but all future probability. So with that, we were able to we were able to assign probability for not just current year but also to 2040 because we ran the model 2019 and 40, and anything in in between will be estimated based on this. probability curve dollar so this probability curve and this cumulative risk dollar for one facility in one half in fixed we had about 205 priority facilities that we had to look at and between them there are 3200 assets so we needed we needed to be creative come up with an automated process so that we can complete this part we can analyze it risk efficiently um, at a large scale so to come up with that right we need to have all the data available we have flood elevation uh we have a process to come up with probability of flood event then we have to develop at the free placement cost of various assets types so that we can assign cost replacement cost to each asset within each facility we can get all flood elevation cost we all form come into asset database and and how will be used to determine the damage cost at an asset level and then at a facility level so then we we asked Andy like I said he is our software developer to look at this process and come up with a tool so he was able to come up with a tool using python and r js based programming that uh, helps in uh, calculating the probability at a facility level and then calculating the monetized flood risk at asset level and also can be used to mark to estimate monetized cumulative risk curve avoided to match level using a particular adaptation strategy the risk tool was developed into two stages like facility tool and asset tool as a tool facility tool is run fast so that you can develop all the probability curves to make it based on the flood elevation and then using that probability curve as an input to the asset level The asset level tool takes that and runs for all the facility, all the assets within each facility. 
to come up with the cumulative risk. It also has a provision to do cumulative risk avoided if you put in the strategy that you're developing and then associated failure rate. So based on the results for this slide two, we were able to easily uh, develop these figures for the JEA to visually see where their high risk um, facilities are. As you can see in both of these graphs, most of the high-risk facilities are around the delivery stuff. We were able to also summarize these little in table and pie chart form so that they can understand which system what it highest monetized risk. And then we were able to rank them, uh, rank each facility type. Um, facilities in each facility type from highest risk to lowest risk so that they can focus on the highest risk. We took, once we have this risk assessment done, we took the highest risk facility and went into developing some adaptive strategies uh, so that JEA can implement and make the system more resilient. While we are developing the strategies, uh, we're developing at asset level or at facility level, depending on the risk. At asset level, we were looking at either elevating uh, the asset itself, if not at least hardening, uh, to put blood proofing around the asset. Sometimes we were looking at both, like in hybrid. And in some cases, we are looking at putting flood walls for the entire facility. Uh, but it's, it's, that that flood wall would be an expensive um, strategy. But but sometimes it's the only option we have. So we looked at these different strategies for various tasks. <clears throat> and uh, once we came up with strategies, we developed the cost for each strategy and then compared it with the benefit of this avoided. Uh, for the strategy so that we have cost and benefit. Once we have the cost-benefit analysis, we are able to develop rate of return for, um, for all the, for the facilities that were analyzed for various scenarios. Scenario 2, 20, 40, 100 years position. Scenario 4, 20, 70, 100 years term. Scenario 7, 500 year long-term high low probability, high risk tones. As you can see, it's not uniform, right? I mean, sometimes you get most rate of return for near-term investment. Sometimes you get most rate of return for long-term investment. So it varies. So this gives a picture, good, nice picture for JEA to take information. We also put that in a rate of return ranking. Uh, basically, we ranked facilities from one to five, five being the facilities that give most bang for buck. So based on the um, curve we developed, rate of return versus the facilities, we were able to easily identify those top facilities that give you most rate of return. I know I ran this through very fast, but feel free to ask. I'll try to ask. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Swami. I appreciate your presentation. Uh, that was interesting to hear about the Jacksonville area in Florida and the electric and water and sewer utility, the, J the JEA. Uh, I, uh, it's time to get to the questions that we have in the comment section of our window here on the right-hand side for those of us who have been watching, if you uh, have any questions or comments, please put those in the in the comment section, and I will uh, get to those as, as best I can with the time we have remaining. Uh, the first question it comes from Renardo uh, Garcia, and it says, uh, thanks for your presentation. What methodology did you use to assess the flooding cost? So we used... Um like explained in the presentation, we, we, we looked at the probability of occurrence 
of flooding based on the asset elevation and the modeled flood elevations and then use that um, to define the probability and then there was there was multiplied by replacement cost of that particular asset to come up with um, flood cost per se. Uh, that's the methodology, but then the probability increases over the time. So we looked at how the probability increased and based on the replacement cost. So that this was cumulated over the time for a 20 year time period. Okay, thank you. Another question from R. Johnson has gotten three, three thumbs up. So I'm going to jump into this one. It says, uh, I'm glad you're covering the risk of not investing in needed mitigation. So many cities and communities kick the can down the road and ignore the long-term implications of potential hazardous conditions and situations. So I guess this isn't as much a question, but it's an acknowledgement that uh, not mitigating has its own costs. Did you have any Thoughts no, that's, that? That, that's a good point. That's one thing that we, we do, especially for these resiliency projects. We look at the implications, not just with existing risk, but over the period of time so that the clients or the municipalities can understand uh, what is the cost of not doing anything, you know, not just for now, over the period, how it increases your cost. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, Timothy Adams asks, how do you assign probability of occurrence in various scenarios which incorporate assumptions about the future? Uh, good question. Uh, so we, we, we looked at three different probabilities uh, in terms of design storms. So if you're running the 100 year storm, you're assigning the 1% probability. And for a 25 year storm, it's a 4% probability. Um, there may be some uncertainties in the future, but uh, we looked at, that's why we looked at a couple of different uh, greenhouse gas emissions so that we can, uh, um, we can look at not just the high emission scenarios, but also lower emission scenarios. And then I didn't go as detailed on the technical side, but what we did was we assigned the weightage between the two greenhouse gas emissions when we we're doing the risk so that so that we are reasonable in our risk assessment even in the future, you know, while assigning these probabilities. Mm -hmm. The next question uh, is, can you, can you talk a little bit more about the calibration of uh, the Matthew storm and how was it done and what did you adjust? Um, the calibration uh, for Matthew, I think we looked at a few things. Uh, I think the major major thing we looked at was adjusting the Manningsen is one thing on the land use side, just fine tuning that. One other thing is um, when you're running this rainfall from the inland side and the tidal from the coastal side, we got to look at how you are timing the peaks of both rainfall and the coastal tide. So that it's so that you're getting to the right calibration parameters, and then we can calibrate to the known conditions. I think that that matching of those two peaks or the time series was one of the biggest things that we were doing. I think there was a lag uh, with inland flooding coming towards the coast and the coastal tide coming towards inland, um, and then we had to adjust that lag time between the peaks to get to the um, Irma calibration, sorry, Matthew calibration. Okay. Well, thank you, Swami. We've reached the end of our session. Uh, we don't have time for the, uh, the remaining few questions here, but uh, thank you for everybody's attendance at this thank session and, and Swami for your good work in putting this together. We appreciate it very much. I guess I will also take this time to remind our our audience, uh, the, the next uh, thing for you to do would be to go to the exhibit hall during this break. We have a break until 11 o'clock central time. And uh, please visit the exhibit hall and see our, our vendors there. Uh, it's an interesting space. If you haven't been there to see it, uh, it's worth your time. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll be doing our plenary session number two. So please join us for that as well. Thank you for your time. And I 
uh, had the privilege to be your moderator today, and I will see you on the flip side. Thank you. Thank you.